Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. In our last lesson, we finished examining the account of Jesus sending out 72 disciples, their return to the Master, and what the Lord had to teach them through that encounter. We are now going to begin a new story, and from this time on, Dr. Luke will be sharing many parables that aren't found in the other Gospels. Let's jump right into this lesson and look at the setting of this event. Verse 25 begins to lay out the scenario of this story and reads, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here's another time where Luke gives a generic time frame of when this event happened. According to Luke, the story is far more important than when it happened or even where it happened. All we can say is that it appears to have taken place during the time when Jesus was starting to make his final trek to Jerusalem. We know this wasn't the final days of that journey, such as John presents in his Gospel. Matthew shares a similar account about an expert in the Mosaic Law that questioned Jesus, but the question is very different from that Dr. Luke records, and so is our Lord's answer. This makes it appear that they are two different events. We find Matthew's account in chapter 22, verses 35 through 40, and the story possibly goes on to verse 46 if this all took place at the same time. Matthew records the lawyer asking Jesus, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? This is far different from what Luke records where the lawyer asks, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That Jesus was questioned by different experts in the Mosaic Law at various times is a very reasonable theory. At one point when Jesus asked the Pharisees a question, they were finally silenced, and we are given this fact in Matthew chapter 22, verse 46. No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This teaches us that Luke's account takes place before the one Matthew recorded. Some scholars believe that it's the same event, which is possible. But I don't think it's probable, since there are so many differences. A religious leader asked Jesus a very similar question as Luke recorded the lawyer asking, but they are without question different accounts. This is found in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 30, and it was a young rich synagogue ruler that asked the question. In this account, the religious leader wasn't trying to trap Jesus, but was asking an honest question. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? The synagogue ruler was looking for another rule to follow, to fill the void that was left in him from the works-based religion that he followed. Jesus' response shook the man, for the gospel of true grace demands far more than does legalistic religion. The story we are studying in this lesson takes place between Jesus and a teacher of the Mosaic Law, who is also called in Scripture a lawyer, an expert in the law, and a scribe. He wasn't a lawyer in the modern sense of the term, but was trained as a teacher in the Mosaic Law and to help settle difficulties in understanding the law. This was a prestigious position, with some even serving on the Sanhedrin Council, which was a ruling council of Israel in all things that pertain to the spiritual life of the people. Since the spiritual and political life of Israel were interwoven with each other, the Sanhedrin's influence also affected the nation's political and civil life of the nation. The Sanhedrin had to submit to Herod and Rome on everything that touched political and civil life of the nation. We see this played out in Christ's crucifixion, where the Sanhedrin was forced to look to Rome to use its civil authority to execute Jesus, because that right had been taken from the nation. We find in this lawyer an educated man who was very cunning. It appears that he was sent with the express purpose to entrap Jesus in some doctrinal error as it relates to the law and oral traditions. This way the Sanhedrin could bring formal charges against Jesus. The reason for setting a trap for Jesus was over his growing popularity that caused him to become a threat to the religious ruling elite, of which the lawyer was an integral part. Some people are combative in nature and want to argue with anyone they can pick a verbal fight with, but this doesn't appear to be why the lawyer was picking this fight. He wanted to entrap Jesus so that he could be brought to trial. There may have been much planning and framing the question that the lawyer asked, since the motive was to trap Jesus in some sort of error. 
The lawyer wanted to frame a question that, no matter how Jesus answered it, would ensnare him in some doctrinal error that he would ultimately use against him. The religious elite wanted to silence Jesus by somehow discrediting him in the minds of the people. Yet what the lawyer asked was a very good question, depending on the motive behind it. This is actually a question that must be asked by every person that wants to become a true follower of Jesus. I'm not saying that people must literally ask that question before they can be saved, though some might ask it. It's a biblical fact that for people to be saved from their sin, they must see that they are sinners. Then they must seek the Savior and learn what He demands from their life. Since the man was an expert in the law, he was looking for some sly way to trap Jesus into somehow speaking against what the law teaches. What the man failed to understand is that Jesus came to fulfill the law, which is something nobody else has ever done except Jesus. The lawyer asked, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The question has to do with how people are made right with God and make heaven their home. As a lawyer, his thoughts would have been centered upon keeping the Mosaic Law and all of its religious, moral, ceremonial, and sacrificial requirements. If he could get Jesus speak against the law and sacrificial system, then he could easily have Jesus labeled as a heretic and discredit him before the people. Though at first glance the question the lawyer asked sounded good and noble, it was actually loaded with many pitfalls and traps. We see from this that the man was dishonest and deceptive in his dealing with Jesus. Now I'm glad to say that the lawyer didn't have the slightest hope of trapping Jesus, but that didn't keep him from trying. Imagine for a moment that you are doing a man-on-the-street interview. With a mic in hand, you ask people this same question. What must you do to inherit eternal life? The answers would certainly be very diverse, with the majority either being sheer opinions or the response that comes out of false religious teaching. If you could get 5% of the people you interviewed to give a biblical answer, I would be shocked. And if you could get people to make the claim that they were living out the biblical answer, the statistics would probably drop all the more. I'm not quoting some professionally gathered polling data, just what I have seen from personal experience and prior polling data. I would venture to say that the majority of listeners to this podcast would be able to give a satisfactory answer on what we must do to inherit eternal life. But get outside of the walls of Bible-believing churches and that number radically drops. When Jesus walked this planet, he gave the true and complete definition on what it takes to inherit eternal life. The foundation of that definition was laid out in the Old Testament. It's through Jesus that we were given the revealed truth on how people enter into fellowship with God by having their sins forgiven through genuine repentance and surrender to the Savior. The Lord prepared all this before the creation of the world. Now I want to ask you the same searching question. What must you do to inherit eternal life? Can you accurately answer that question, and will the Lord accept your answer on Judgment Day? You need to make sure that your answer lines up with what the Scriptures teach. Otherwise, they are mere opinions, or maybe even worse, doctrines of devils. There's a correct answer to this question, but the question must first be asked with the right motive. Though the lawyer asks what appears to be a biblically sound question, he believes some gross lies and was too blind to see the lies he was believing. Let me quote what the lawyer said, and then see if you can see the trap he fell into. He said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As an expert in the Mosaic Law, he would have been well-schooled in the law and rabbinical commentaries on the law. At the time of Jesus, those commentaries on the law were verbally passed on to those trained in the Mosaic Law, and these were referred to as the Oral Traditions. This collection of oral laws is called the Mishnah, and was first compiled in written form about 200 A.D., and it is an integral part of the Talmud. The Talmud is the collection of Jewish law and tradition consisting of the Mishnah and the Gemara. They were combined in Israel around 400 A.D., while the larger, more important edition was produced in Babylon around 500 A.D. The Gemara is a section of the Talmud that's essentially a commentary on the Mishnah, so for all practical purposes, it's a commentary on the commentary on Scripture. I mention this to show how the religious Jews were bogged down in oral tradition, which were commentaries and opinions on the Mosaic Law. These are the traditions of men that Jesus confronted because the laws they heaped upon the people were above and beyond what the Lord demanded from the Mosaic Law itself. 
The lawyer Jesus was dealing with was enslaved to the oral traditions that ultimately kept people from knowing God. Yet the man would have looked at Jesus as a Sabbath breaker and a despiser of the oral traditions. The lawyer may have been expecting Jesus to give some new rule for obtaining salvation. Instead, he was surprised that Jesus pointed him to Scripture to give an answer. The question the scribe was basically asking was, What law am I failing to live that I need to begin living so that I can inherit eternal life? Though the lawyer was laying a trap for Jesus, I think he knew something was lacking in his strict religious life that failed to satisfy the longing of his soul. Salvation, according to this man and a multitude of other Jews, was a workspace religion that was defined by over 600 laws. All these laws could do was to hide the face of God from them. What they believed about God and salvation had become a terrible perversion. It's interesting to note that Jesus deals with the man by taking him to the Word of God and not the oral traditions that were often contrary to the Word of God. In verse 26, Jesus responded to the question the lawyer asked by asking him a question in return. He asked, What is written in the law? How do you read it? This is a very wise move on Jesus' part, for it put the lawyer to the test who had come to test Jesus. Jesus went to the true authority, which wasn't the oral traditions that were merely commentaries on the word itself. The religious Jews often put greater emphasis upon upholding the tradition of the elders than upon obedience to the scriptures themselves. Jesus asked the question with an interesting twist to it that most people miss. He asked, how do you read it? The oral traditions were divided up between conservative, which were those who held to the letter of the law, and liberal, who strove to uphold the spirit of the law. In either case, rabbis were commenting on the law and had built schools of thought that fought against each other. Jesus asked the lawyer what his opinion was on how people inherit eternal life, according to the scriptures, not according to the oral traditions. The Lord steered clear of the oral tradition by clarifying that the lawyer must answer according to what the Word of God teaches. This is extremely important for us to understand. The oral traditions were the opinions of men that veered away from the faithful teaching of Scripture to add burden upon burden which weighed the people down. Our faith must rest upon Scripture alone, not upon commentaries, preaching, or teaching, no matter how orthodox a person may be. Any teaching that's contrary to the faithful truths of God's Word must be rejected as error. Our faith must be placed upon Christ alone and the sure teaching of the Word of God. This means that we must guard ourselves against the cultural influences that can negatively affect how we understand God's Word. This affects us more than we think, for we are products of our environment, whether we like it or not. It's far better for us to strive to understand the positive and negative influences in our life rather than ignorantly taking whatever path our emotions or intellect take us. We can change by the grace of God if we see what's negatively affecting us from our culture. If we are ignorant of these influences and just keep doing what we've been doing, the consequences may be dire. We always reap what we sow, whether sin unto death or righteousness unto life. The lawyer was rigid in his religious views about the Mosaic law. The question that Jesus asked showed him what the law required, which would help him to understand how he had failed to follow the law as he thought he did. An honest examination of the Mosaic law reveals that we are law breakers, and this would have been a painful revelation to this legalistic religious leader. The lawyer's answer was excellent and biblically sound. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer was quoting from two different passages of the Torah, also called the Pentateuch, which consists of the first five books of Moses. The first is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The second could come from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The lawyer was forced to give the best answer he knew or dishonor his own reputation. To give a false answer would put him in a difficult situation. Jesus wasn't only turning the table on the lawyer by forcing him to answer a loaded question. 
but the Lord was also responding to the man in the teaching style of a rabbi of that day. The lawyer would have been very familiar with this style of teaching, since that's how he had been taught, and how he more than likely taught others. He quickly gave the two great laws that encompass all the laws within the Mosaic Law, which either relate to how we are to get right with God and walk before Him, and how we are to love others. Jesus proved to this law keeper that he's actually a law breaker, because all of mankind breaks those two commandments far more than we realize. To live out these two commands will take our entire being, all the faculties of our heart, mind, soul, and body. Nobody can even come close to living them out through half-hearted devotion or legalistic rule-keeping. The lawyer said we must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. To love the Lord with all our heart is to love Him supremely, to love Him more than people, possessions, occupation, nationality, and most of all self. To love the Lord with all of our soul is to love Him with the greatest affection and pure, passionate desire. To love the Lord with our entire mind is to love Him to the full extent of our intellectual capacity, where our thoughts are filled with Jesus and the great salvation He has given us. And to love the Lord with all of our strength is to serve Him with everything that is within us. In verse 28, Jesus replied to the man, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Jesus spoke the absolute truth. He clearly said that there is something we must do to inherit eternal life. And this idea goes against a lot of teaching that's in the church today. Paul taught this truth by stating that we are saved by grace through faith. We have an irreplaceable part to play in our salvation. There's that which only God can do and will do, and there's that which is our responsibility. What's our responsibility the Lord won't do for us or force us to live contrary to our desire? When we look at these two commands, we are taught that if we want eternal life, then there are certain things we must do. Yet at the same time, Jesus hasn't turned the true faith into a list of do's and don'ts. These two commands are totally relational. Our relationship with God is the most important of our life, and it's out of our relationship with Him that we will find the grace to properly love others. Though the law gives some guidance to how we are to worship God and to love others, our ability to live out the two greatest commands can only come through divine grace. The power to love others selflessly comes through loving God supremely. When we fail at loving others selflessly, it's because we have failed to love God supremely. It's from our relationship with God that we receive the grace to live as one of Christ's disciples. In verse 29, we get a glimpse of the character of the lawyer. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? The impure motive behind the lawyer's questioning Jesus in the first place is seen in that he was trying to trap Jesus for the express purpose that he might have a way to incriminate him before the Sanhedrin council. I don't doubt that the lawyer really thought that Jesus was detrimental to the people and nation of Israel, and that's why he wanted to find some crime the Lord committed to silence him. The lawyer's response to Jesus was a clear expression of self-righteousness in wanting to make himself look righteous by justifying himself before the people. This is an expression of pride. He also wanted to think well of himself as a keeper of the Mosaic Law, which we know he wasn't. Those two commands, though they are beautiful, also expose our depravity because we break them on a regular basis. Only Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament laws because he perfectly lived out the first two commands. Jesus actually went beyond those two commands and to not only love others as he would want to be loved, but he loved mankind with the depths of selfless, sacrificial love that only God can comprehend. Here was a man that thought he kept the law, but was looking for some way to excuse himself from the demands of loving God supremely and loving others selflessly. I imagine that the man thought that he was very witty in his response to Jesus' command, Do this and you will live. His response didn't focus upon the greatest commandment to love God supremely. That he conveniently forgot to mention. Maybe it was because he thought he lived it out, which he didn't, and his actions towards Jesus proved this. He probably thought he lived out the second command to love others as he wanted to be loved, which he most certainly didn't do as well. The lawyer had created a religion that was filled with loopholes, and he was a professional at finding them. 
He jumped through one of these loopholes whenever he felt himself hemmed into a corner, and that's exactly what Jesus was doing to him. One commentator made the point, With theoretical correctness, he appears to have been uniting practical disobedience with his religion. That puts it in a nutshell. People want to think that they are right with God while they continue living in disobedience against God. This lie has damned many souls to hell. James hit the nail on the head in James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. This is a choice of the will and it ensnares people into developing a corrupt character that's household to God. The real difficulty to practicing sinners is that they want to continue in their sin, and it's irrelevant if they are religious or not. What irony! To correctly quote the Word of God while deliberately refusing to obey it. The scribe failed to comprehend that it's only by mercy that people can live in right fellowship with God and inherit eternal life. The fact that he thought himself righteous is evidence that he doesn't understand mercy or its necessity for obtaining salvation in a holy life. The man asked, Who is my neighbor? and was hoping Jesus would say his relative and friend. As an expert in the Mosaic Law, he thought it was safe to love relatives, friends, and most of the Jews, at least those who weren't ceremonially unclean. The word neighbor in Greek refers to one who lives nearby. Of course, nearby could be a relative term that's open to personal interpretation. Outside of the people of Israel, the religious Jews considered everyone was unclean and enemies of God. This included the Roman conquerors, Gentiles in general, Samaritans, and those Jews that he classified as sinners. Yet Jesus taught the lawyer the definition of neighbor, and he did this out of a desire for the man to repent and be saved. Our Lord's definition of neighbor is contrary to all the religious teaching the lawyer had been given, along with all the prejudice that defined him. Jesus held a mirror before his face, where he could clearly see an image of what kind of man he really was. Would he honestly see what kind of man he was and remember so that he would repent and be converted? Or would he forget and continue living as he had been in the sin of legalistic religion? He was a hypocrite, a man that claimed one thing, but lived another. Now we will begin studying the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is our Lord's definition of neighbor put into story format. In direct reply to the lawyer's snide answer, Jesus began his parable in verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. The King James opens verse 30 with, And Jesus answering said, while other translations say something similar, or simply use some version of replied. Commentator Adam Clark brought out an interesting point on this to show that there's more going on than most translations reveal. Clark wrote that the meaning of the phrase, in reply, is more accurately understood as, then Jesus took him up. This reveals that the lawyer's response was a challenge, and that Jesus took up that challenge by giving the parable of the Good Samaritan. The phrase, down from Jerusalem, has nothing to do with the direction of a compass, but with Jerusalem being at a higher elevation. No matter what direction people left Jerusalem, they had to go down. Jesus mentioned a specific road that goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and it was known to be a road where robbers often waylaid unsuspecting people. Because this road had a bad reputation, people didn't travel it alone, but in large groups to deter bandits. That the man was traveling alone is a remarkable point because it would have been unheard of except for only the most demanding of circumstances. Those listening to Jesus would have wondered why the man would travel alone on such a dangerous road. Then they would say that he got what he deserved for not waiting to travel with a caravan or with some other people. One commentator suggested that a possible reading of the verse could be a certain man of Jerusalem going down to Jericho. This would clearly show that the man who was attacked and robbed was a Jew, but all those listening to the story would have thought that anyway. It appears that the man might have been more well-to-do since they stripped him of his clothes. If he had been poor, his clothing would have been of little value. But if he was wealthier, then his clothes could have been of considerable value, and this would have grabbed the attention of the bandits. 
What value would there be in attacking a poor man? But if he looked more well-to-do, then to rob him would be worth the effort. By stripping the man naked, his nationality would have been unknown. Those listening to Jesus give this parable would have taken the nameless man for a Jew, like I mentioned just a moment ago. The cruelty of the brigands is seen in that they beat the man. This was done either because he was resisting them, or they hated his nationality, or were jealous of his wealth. Here is the old poor versus the rich animosity that's in every culture and era. It's not just that they robbed the man and beat him, but they left him half dead knowing that the desert sun would finish him off. It's strange how we can be cruel to others while wanting kindness shown to ourselves. How long the man was left there, Jesus never said, but he went on to give the next phase of the story, stating in verse 31, A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. The priest seems to be traveling alone like the man that was robbed. Yet the next verse shows that a Levite was traveling right behind him and gives us to believe that at this point in the day there were enough people traveling on the road to make it relatively safe. We can't say for sure, but given that both a priest and Levite were traveling on the road, it makes it appear that they had both finished their two-week service in the temple and were heading back home. Jericho was said to have a large number of priests and Levites because that tribe wasn't given any land as a possession like the rest of the tribes of Israel. The Lord declared that He was their possession because He had given them the privilege of serving in the tabernacle and later in the temple. This is something that none of the other tribes were allowed to do. Since they were not given an inheritance in the land, they had to live in cities and villages, some of which were given to the tribe of Levi. It was under the reign of King David when the priests and Levites were divided into groups that rotated throughout the year to perform their temple service. This allowed them to take care of their family and business, while still being able to receive a portion of what came into the temple that was designated to the priests and Levites. After their two-week service, both men were walking home. The priests were Levites that came from the family of Aaron, and they were the only ones that could serve as priests. They thought themselves superior to the Levites that took care of the temple and did other duties in helping the priests. Though the priest and Levite may have known each other, they weren't friends and walked separate from each other. Here is another expression of the ugly nature of pride. Jesus said that the priest saw the man, which means he saw the man lying in his blood, not knowing if he was dead or alive. Priests were forbidden to touch the dead, for that would make them unclean. To be unclean meant that they couldn't serve in the temple or receive the priestly portion because they weren't fit to serve. If the priest went to the man and found that he was dead, then he would be unclean and have to go back to Jerusalem to confess his uncleanness. He would have to go through particular rituals and sacrifices that were very costly. Then he would have to go to a portion of the temple that was designated for unclean priests. This wasn't required by the law but was a means to shame priests into submission and obedience. When the priest looked at the man, he said to himself, It's too expensive and time-consuming to show this man compassion. Besides, I'm forbidden to touch the dead, so I don't have to show compassion. It's not my responsibility. What excuses do we give for not showing compassion to others? It's too costly. It's too time-consuming. It's not my calling. It's not my responsibility. In the end, we better make sure what Jesus has to say about our excuses before we place any substance upon them. We may find that our excuses for not showing compassion to others were nothing more than selfishness, cowardice, and pride. May God deliver us from ourselves. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. So come wash in the river Come drink your fill